So I first did this study last fall. It is on Matthew chapter 24, verse 34, where Jesus made a statement. He said, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So, you know, what? who is this generation that Jesus was referring to? Was he referring to his own generation or did he refer to another generation? And as you see in the title, you know, where I said Jesus' generation versus the last generation. So I believe that, you know, the reference here is not to Jesus' own generation when he was here in the days of his flesh, but it refers to a particular generation, which will be the last generation, you could say, that would uh, be uh, that would be begotten or that would be here on the earth before the second coming of Jesus Christ. So as I was doing this study, I was listening to Isaiah the other day, and again, I heard something in there in Isaiah 53, which is, of course, a very famous chapter about the servant, about Jesus and Messiah, and, you know, his sacrifice. And uh, that's uh, when I heard that, you know, I said, yes, this is again referring to the generation that was going to be around when Jesus was here on the earth. And that generation is not the one that is being referred to in Matthew 24, verse 34. Now in Isaiah, we can read in Isaiah 53, in verse 8, it says, He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? So again, it is referring particularly to the very generation that was around when Jesus was here in the days of his flesh. And that generation has some unique characteristics, which I have, you know, uh, which I have listed, which I have done a study on in this video. And I would like you to, you know, use your Bibles and, you know, take them study along with your Bible so you can see that, you know, there is a substantial difference between the generation of Jesus Christ and the generation he was referring to in Matthew 24, 34. And they are so different that they possibly cannot be the same. So in Isaiah, he said, you know, he was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation? Basically, you know, one of uh, the meanings of the word declare is to mediate or to, you know, uh, to lodge a complaint against or to bring to trial, so to speak. And that's what he's saying is that who is going to justify this generation? And as we shall see in this study that follows, there really is no justification that can possibly be offered for that particular generation because their evil, I believe, exceeded that of any generation before them or any that followed them. And that would include the time of the days of Noah, when Jesus told us, when God told us that the earth was filled with violence in those days. So here it is, and it is a study that uh, I did last summer. I'm reposting it here with this brief update. Today I want to do something again, like talk about, uh, you know, some uh, these prophetic teachings, uh, something we have been discussing in past videos. There's a lot of false teaching in regards to, you know, the particularly in regards to the timing of the fulfillment, okay, of uh, the biblical prophecies of Matthew 24, uh, Mark 13, Luke 21, and the book of Revelation in particular. And of course, a lot of these uh, prophecies are also found in the Old Testament, you know, in uh, the writings of Daniel and the book of Zechariah, Isaiah, etc. as well. And uh, there are many different views that are presented, you know, some say that these were already all fulfilled back in Jesus's own generation, because that's what he meant when he said, you know, this generation shall not pass away. There are some that say, you know, some things have been fulfilled, some are yet to be fulfilled, you know, that the seals have been opened or the seals are not open, but the trumpets have been sounded, all that kind of So there's a lot of confusing teaching out there. So although this information that I'm going to share with you today most of it has already been presented here, but again, like, you know, the Apostle Paul wrote, you know, it is not uh, laborious for me to, you know, repeat the same things over and over. So as it is in the same here, is that it's good to go over the same information over again, and then more nuggets of truth come out, and then we become more grounded, and it becomes more revelation for us. So this uh, is titled, you know, This Generation, Jesus's generation compared to the last generation, which uh, is the end of the world generation. So I'm going to share my screen here. And this is actually just a little, uh, you know, uh, study that I've done. I'm going to actually email it out as well. 
so that uh, later on, you know, when uh, anybody wants to study the information in it, they won't just have the video, they can have it in writing as well. All right, so let me begin by sharing my screen. Here we go. So I hope everybody can see and hear me okay. And so let's let's begin now. So as this generation compared to the last generation, meaning Jesus' generation, the people that were living in his time compared to the people that should be living in the last times when his second coming, at least the sign of his second coming shall be seen by them. So, so here in Matthew 24, 34, we read, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Same thing in Mark 13, 39, Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. And again in Luke 21, 32, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. Okay. So again, you know, the generation and all these things that uh, basically what Jesus is saying is that all the things that he prophesied in that chapter in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, that there would be a generation that will see all those things fulfilled. Okay? And I believe only one generation. So again, the teachings, you know, that people have that, you know, some of it was fulfilled back in 500 years ago, some was fulfilled 100 years ago and all that, that does not jive that does not uh it is not correct understanding because jesus said it would happen in only the time of one generation so based on the verses quoted above many people teach that this generation meant that the generation by this generation jesus meant the generation that was living when he was here on the earth in the days in his days in the flesh in the land of israel and therefore, all the prophecies of Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, as well as the book of Revelation have already been fulfilled, including his second coming. Okay, which is, and I understand that it is a ridiculous teaching, but there are so many ridiculous interpretations about prophecy that we really have to dig deeper and deeper and deeper to make sure that we are understanding what is correctly being taught in the Bible. Some also teach that some of these prophecies have been fulfilled while others, including the most important one of Jesus' second coming, are yet in the future, okay? So that's what they say, you know, yeah, that prophecy about uh, Jerusalem being destroyed had been fulfilled, but, uh, you know, some other things like the Antichrist hasn't yet come. So, you know, they mix it up that, you know, half of it has been fulfilled or a quarter has been fulfilled and some haven't been. And, uh, you know, it was fulfilled, uh, some will say in 80s, 70s, some will say in the Middle Ages, Dark Ages, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all over the place. But I believe in a God being that he is not the author of confusion, that he says my words are plain to him that understands that you know, he would not teach us anything in such a confusing manner. Now, God does hide things in different portions of scripture. So it is our job to compare scripture to scripture, to study, to find, to study deep into the word of God, to go deep into the word of God, to understand the deep things of God, okay? So that I can understand, but at the same time, it is not that, you know, in, in the end, we will find that everything has a symmetry, everything fits together perfectly, it is not confusing. It actually, when we start doing a deep study, that, you know, no matter, there could be a scripture in Genesis, and there could be one in Revelation, but they will complete a beautiful, they will paint a beautiful picture, which will, you know, make everything clear to us. That's, that is true, that God's nuggets of truth are hidden all over his Bible, all over the Bible. But when we search for them as for hidden treasures, then everything fits together and it makes perfect sense. Okay, the purpose of this study is to determine if this generation to which the prophecies of these three chapters in the Gospels and the book of Revelation apply is the same generation as the generation that was alive in Jesus's days here on earth. So I will begin by quoting numerous scriptures that detail what Jesus had to say about his own generation, and then compare what he prophesied for that generation, particularly in Matthew 23, to determine if what he prophesied about his own generation is different than what he prophesied in Matthew 24, etc., about the last generation that would see the end of the world, and the sign of his second coming. In Matthew 24, 3, the disciples asked Jesus directly to give them a sign of his second coming and of the end of the world. So did, now let us see if Jesus also prophesied the same things, if he also gave these signs that he gave to his disciples 
to his to the multitudes to the masses of his own generation in Matthew 23 was that which he prophesied would happen to his generation something entirely different than what he taught his disciples in Matthew 24 would happen in the future to the entire world okay the Lord Jesus, John the Baptist, and the Apostle Paul wrote much about the uniqueness of Jesus' generation and how that generation was destined to suffer God's wrath more than any other generation. That generation was truly different than any generation in history before or after. That generation was given more evidence of God's power working in Jesus than any other generation. Because Jesus did so many works in the time of that generation that the world itself cannot contain all the books that could be written about uh, that about uh, that time, about those works. Therefore, more was required of that generation than of any other generation. We read that in scripture, to whom much is given, much is required. And frankly, there was no other generation that was given as much in the ways of the works of God done in their midst as that generation that was alive when Jesus was here in the body in uh, you know some time ago so the judgment of the generation is not the same as the judgment of the world at large as a matter of fact even Sodom and Gomorrah will not suffer the same gen judgment as the generation that lived in Jesus's time so before we look at what Jesus had to say about his own generation let's see what John the Baptist had to say about the people that were living in Israel shortly before Jesus's ministry began so we can read in Matthew chapter 3 verse 7 for when he saw many of the forest Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of wipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And again in Luke 3, 7, then said he to the multitude that came to be baptized of him, O generation of wipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So beginning with John the Baptist, who called both the multitude that came to him, as well as the Pharisees and Sadducees as generations of wipers, Jesus himself used some very harsh words about that generation as we read in the following scriptures that I will quote. So one observation I would like to make is that in the case of both John the Baptist, as well as of Jesus himself, whenever they spoke to the people of their own generation, they spoke openly and directly to the masses in public settings. You know, they'd be out in the field or whatever, in the temple and uh, in a public, somebody's house, etc., in a courtyard. And uh, Jesus would be talking to the multitudes. But when we begin to read scripture carefully, it'll become apparent that the things that he talked to his disciples privately were different than what he talked to the masses. Okay. So whenever they spoke to the people of their own generation, that's both John and uh, John the Baptist and Jesus, they spoke openly and directly to the masses in public settings, never privately, as Jesus often spoke with his disciples, especially in regard to the Olivet Discourse, which are the prophecies of Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. These prophecies were given privately to just a handful of his disciples, not even a handful, as a matter of fact, just to four not to the multitudes in the wilderness or in the presence of the Pharisees and the lawyers in the temple in Jerusalem. The reason for this, I believe, is that these prophecies that were given privately did, to his disciples did not apply to his own generation, but to a specific generation that would rise sometime in the future. When we begin to list some of the verses of scripture that concern Jesus's words about his own generation, it will soon become apparent that there is not much good that he had to say about that generation. This is particularly true in regard to the prophesied judgments that would befall that generation, which were extremely severe. It is also significant that Jesus prophesied some judgments on that generation and on that generation only, not on the world at large. Those judgments did not concern the whole world as do the prophecies of Matthew 24 and the other gospels. Now, here are some scriptures, and these are just a few of them that Jesus had to say, what he had to say about his own generation. So we can read in Matthew 12, 34. O generation of wipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Then in Matthew 12, 39. But he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation. Now, look at the words that Jesus is using about them. Generation of wipers, evil and adulterous generation. Seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. I mean, you know, when you really think about it, like what was Jesus doing in there? He was opening blind eyes, right? He was uh, making the lame walk. He was uh, raising the dead. 
okay, more than once. I mean, the works that he was doing, turning water into wine, et cetera. And these people still had the audacity to come and ask him to give them a sign whether he was the Messiah or not. Okay. Matthew 12, 41, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with, meaning against this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, the greater than Jonah is here. Matthew 12, 42, the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with, meaning against this generation and shall condemn it for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, the greater than Solomon is here. Matthew 12, 45, then goeth he, and take it with him, with himself, seven other spirits more wicked than, than himself, and they shall enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So he, Jesus had given them a parable about this uh, evil spirit that was being cast out. And then you know that the person that the house has been cleaned and it has been uh, swept and garnished. And then the spirit sees, you know, this is, this is not even better than before. So he goes and takes seven other spirits that are more wicked than himself, and he comes and dwells in there. Okay, so what was the reason of teaching this parable when Jesus was, you know, talking some very harsh words about his generation? Even so, Jesus said, you know, and the last state of the man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. In this parable, Jesus taught that just as the Pharisees, through their lies and greed, made people twofold the children of hell, that you can read in Matthew 23, 15. Okay. Therefore, this generation, his own generation, will suffer sevenfold the judgment of God that would come upon all the other generations, such as that of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. He compared them to somebody that became seven times more wicked okay, than they originally were after he had come and spoken to them. Matthew 16, 4, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah, and he left them and departed, okay? He departed from the Pharisees and the masses of the people after giving them such warnings and uh, pronouncing such judgments upon them, okay? He didn't sit down and then start, you know, giving them deep teachings about his own death and burial and resurrection like he did with the disciples or about what was going to happen towards the end of this world, what his sign would be. He never told them any of those things, okay? He left them and departed. He departed from the Pharisees and the masses of people, just like he departed from the temple in Matthew 23. He departed from the temple after passing judgment on his own evil generation and on Jerusalem. He did not stick around to give them multiple and unmistakable signs of the end of the world and of his second coming. In Matthew 23, 33, we can read, Ye serpents, ye generation of wipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? I mean, that's pretty, that's a very, very serious judgment that Jesus was pronouncing upon his generation, okay? Matthew 22 and 23 are two lengthy chapters about what Jesus had to say about his generation and their relentless opposition to him. Opposition, not just in words, but in their numerous attempts to kill him. These two chapters give a very good overview especially of the hatred that Pharisees and lawyers, the priestly class had for Jesus and his grief over the hardness of their hearts. I will read a passage from Matthew 23 that is a prophecy of judgment that was sure to come upon that very generation. So the prophecies of Jesus in Matthew 23 are not directed towards the whole world as are the prophecies of Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and the book of Revelation. No, the prophecies of Matthew 23 were directed at the generation that was alive in Jesus's day and upon whom judgment would be passed even before that, judge, that generation would pass away. But as we shall see, the judgment prophesied to come upon Jerusalem in that very generation, which happened by 80, 70 or thereabouts, was just the judgment of Jerusalem or Judea and the evil generation that it was the judgment of the evil generation that rejected and killed their own Messiah it was not the judgment of the world, which is yet to come. The world did not suffer judgment in AD 70, so the prophecies of the end of the world pertain to another generation, not to Jesus's generation. This is very much confirmed by the apostles, by Paul, by John, by Peter, that the second coming of Jesus, which was signal, which would which would be this, the, or, or, which would be the signal that the, of the fulfillment of all these things prophesied about the end of the world in Matthew and other passages in Matthew 24 and other passages, would not be seen in their own generation, 
but well in the future. Okay, so I'm going to show you from scripture what the apostles were teaching as to how long, you know, that uh, the second coming was going to be. None of them taught that it was going to be in their own lifetime. In Matthew 23, 29, we read, Won't the use scribes and Pharisees hypocrites? Because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which kill the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents. Now look how many times he used this, these words like, you know, I mean, how would anybody, how difficult must have been for Jesus, you know, who came to save these people to call them serpents and wipers, you know, and all these other things that he spoke to them. Ye serpents, ye generation of wipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom ye flew between, slew between the temple and the altar. Verily, I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. See, this is where this teaching is uh, falsified by so many people out there because Jesus used the exact same phraseology as he did in Matthew 24. He said all these things, and he said this generation. So they say, okay. Since that is the same thing that he said in Matthew 24, 34, that, you know, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Then uh, in, in Matthew 23, 36, he said, all these things shall come upon this generation. So it must be the same generation. But no, it isn't. We got to gain search deep. We got to look into, you know, compare scripture to scripture. Then we shall understand what generation was being meant by Jesus. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophets and stones them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till ye say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. In Matthew 23, 36, Jesus plainly told his own generation that all these things that he just spoke to them, meaning God's judgment, by being held accountable for all the righteous blood ever shed upon the earth, would come upon them. He did not tell them that he was coming in the clouds to gather them to himself. Those prophecies of Matthew 24 and other passages are meant for an entirely different generation that will see some entirely different things. So what Jesus said prophesied in Matthew 24 would happen, all these things in Matthew 24, and the term this generation, though they are both used in Matthew 23 and Matthew 36 and Matthew 24, 34, but are all these things prophesied in Matthew 23, 36, the same as all these things that Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24, and we shall soon find out that they are not. Many different signs than just the one sign Jesus said would be given to his own generation were given to the disciples privately in Matthew 24 and in other parallel passages. Different signs, different generations, different time for the fulfillment of those signs. The generation that will see the signs of Matthew 24 fulfilled is the last generation that will be alive before the second coming. It is not Jesus' own generation. Why was Jesus now, you know, here, let's also study as to why was Jesus' generation different than any other generation in history? And why would all of the righteous blood ever shed on the earth come upon that generation? For one, that is the only generation that saw the creator himself come and dwell in their midst as one of them. But how did they receive him? In John chapter 1, verse 10, we read, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Now we can understand that the world at large did not know him, but his own were supposed to. They were supposed to have recognized him as their Messiah, that he was the prophet. He was the son of God. They should have recognized him, but they did not. Not only did they not receive him when he came, even after numerous signs, you know, I mean, I should say countless signs proved he was the Messiah, right from the time of his birth with the singing of the angels and the coming of the wise men, but even when he began his ministry and showed God's powers, 
by doing more miracles than can be recorded in all the books in the world. You can read that in the, in the Gospel of John, that if all the things that he did were to be written down, even the world could not contain all the books that would be written. Okay, They not only condemned him in words, I mean, they were speaking harsh words against him all the time, but they also attempted to destroy him, to kill him on more than one occasion. You can read in Matthew chapter 12, verse 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held the council against him, how they might destroy him. And that's why Matthew 12 was one of those chapters where Jesus has some very, very harsh things to speak about these Pharisees and the Sadducees and about his own generation. In Mark chapter 3, verse 6, and the Pharisees went forth and straight away took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Do you see against him, against him, against him? Were they for him? No, they were not for him. Okay. Mark 14, 1, after two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. Put him to death. Okay. So not only were they speaking against him, what they wanted to do was to kill him. Luke 4, 28. And all day in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath because he said that he was the Messiah. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereupon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. And in John 8, 59, these are just some verses of scripture. There's many, many more about how, you know, how opposed they were to Jesus and all the evil things that they wanted to do to him. And then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. In John chapter 12, verse 10, in John chapter 11, you know, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But what did these chief priests want to do? But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Okay, Not only did they want to kill Jesus, who raised Lazarus from the dead, they also wanted to kill Lazarus. The depth of such evil is very difficult to comprehend. That instead of falling in their faces and worshiping him, who worked the works that could only be possible by the power of God, they wanted to kill him because they because he threatened their earthly power. That's what it was all about. These are just a few of the numerous instances, in numerous, countless instances in which Jesus was vehemently opposed by the people of his own generation, especially by the so-called authorities of the day. Such opposition was a constant battle for Jesus, not isolated incidents. And though the common people listened to him, in the end, they too sided with the rulers, and they too demanded his blood, crying out, crucify him, crucify him. In Mark in chapter 15, in verse 12, we read, And Pilate answered and said unto them again, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? Okay. And they cried out, Crucify him. Crucify him. And they cried out the more exceedingly, exceedingly crucify him. Pilate was determined to let Jesus go, but it was the common people who formed the mob and demanded at the instigation of the authorities that he be crucified. You know, if it was just the chief priests or whatever that were, that were asking Pilate to crucify him, he was going to let Jesus go. But it was the mob that was just the same people that, you know, cried out exceedingly, the Bible tells us, to crucify him. Okay. Okay. These are the, for the most part, these were the same people who had witnessed his miracles, heard him preach, ate the fish and bread that he multiplied and fed thousands with. Yet in the end, they were the ones that cried out the more exceedingly to crucify him. Matthew chapter 27, verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made. Why? Because so many people were out there yelling and, you know, making a tumult you know, yelling and screaming and demanding that Jesus be crucified. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude. See, it was a multitude. It wasn't just a few chief priests or Pharisees. It was a multitude. And washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. Then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and on our, and on our children. Okay. It was a multitude before whom Pilate declared Jesus to be a just man. And their response was a demand to shed his blood and that they would hold themselves and their children responsible for the shedding of Jesus's innocent blood. This is exactly what Jesus had prophesied against them a very short time before his betrayal by Judas, that this generation would be held accountable for all the righteous blood shed upon the earth till that time. And, it, and in addition, they now made themselves accountable for the shedding of Jesus's blood as well. Having provided this generation proofs beyond number through the works that he did, 
as evidence of his divine authority, they denied not just his words, but also his works, which no other man had ever done on earth in any generation. So what Jesus prophesied for that generation was destruction and desolation. And those prophecies would be fulfilled before that generation passed away, which is exactly what happened not many years after Jesus' death and resurrection. This generation, already condemned to be held accountable for all the righteous blood ever shed on earth, added to their condemnation by holding themselves accountable for Jesus' blood as well. And not knowing and believing, and for not knowing or believing their day of visitation, a day and time not witnessed by any other generation. Was there any other generation that saw the Messiah, God in the flesh, visit them? No, there weren't. Okay. Not then, they were not before and after, no other generation. So that's why this generation is, is unique. His, meaning Jesus' generation, was indeed a unique generation that saw things no other generation saw, yet they believed not his words or his works. And this is what Jesus said to them in John chapter 10, verse 37. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. The reason why that generation was different than any other generation ever in history is because God himself came and dwelt among them in bodily form as written in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Okay, So that's what made that generation different. They were the only ones that saw God manifest in the flesh amongst them. Jesus proved his divine origins beyond doubt by healing the sick, opening blind eyes, raising the dead, and many more such works that no other man had ever done before or since that time. It is not every day that we see God incarnate walking amongst us, turning water into wine, walking in water, calming a raging sea, and leaving no doubt that he was more than just a mere man, even though he wore the body of a man. So Jesus' own generation was different than any other generation of because of what they saw, but even after seeing and hearing all these demonstrations of divine power, they still asked him for more signs to prove that he was indeed God and not a mere man. Because they had been shown so many signs that no other generation had ever seen, when they asked for a sign that they were told bluntly that no sign would be given them except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Okay, The only sign that they would be given would be his death and resurrection which they would not believe, like, you know, even as they did not believe him, even after all the works that he did amongst them. So yes, they would be given the sign of, uh, the, of by his death and resurrection, but they of course would not believe it. But Jesus in Matthew 12, 39, but he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeking after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now that is uh, to his own generation, Jesus made it very clear that they, they would be given no sign except the one sign of the prophet Jonah, that like Jonah rose out of the mouth of the whale after three days, so would Jesus rise from the dead after three days. Now contrast this with what Jesus said to his own disciples in Matthew 24, when they asked him for signs, not just of his second coming, but also of the end of the world. To his own generation, Jesus no, gave no sign of his second coming or of the end of the world or anything prophetic for that matter. They did not even believe his first coming. What possible interest would they have had in his second coming? They wanted him just to end the Roman rule, not to end the world. When Jesus spoke to his generation, he spoke to the multitudes or to the people in the temple. And his words for them, more often than not, were words of warning and of pending judgment, not of a second coming for them to redemption. His prophecies, especially regarding his own death and resurrection and his second coming and the end of the world were prophecies he gave privately to very few of his disciples because those prophecies were not meant for the multitude, especially not for the hypocritical Pharisees and Sadducees that were always trying to entrap him in his words and to, to, to you know, find ways how they could kill him. Therefore, none of the prophecies of Matthew 24 and parallel passages apply to Jesus's generation. All these things that Jesus prophesied in Matthew 23, 36 that would come upon this generation, meaning his own generation are very different then all these things that are listed in Matthew 24, et cetera. If the things prophesied are different, then the generation that will see all these things fulfilled are also different. In Matthew 23, 35, that upon you, Jesus' generation may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you sleep between the temple and the altar. 
36, verily, I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. By understanding which group of people that Jesus was speaking to and what he said about them, it is in understanding that that it becomes clear that it's impossible Though the same term, this generation was, was used by Jesus in Matthew 23, 36, and also in Matthew 24, 34, that he was referring to the same generation in both these prophetic passages of scriptures. He was not. He prophesied the coming judgment of his own generation throughout the Gospels and always in front of multitudes of people or in the temple. Even as he was being led away to be crucified, he prophesied imminent judgment upon his generation. He never gave them any signs of the end of the world or of his second coming. You can read this in Luke uh, 23, 27. And as he's being led away to be crucified and there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus turning unto them said, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children, okay? For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the paths which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. But if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Even till his last few hours in his body of flesh, he warned the people of his own generation that their desolation was at the doorstep. That would happen within their own lifespan and that of their children. His own generation was facing desolation and destruction, which happened at the hands of the Romans before that generation had passed away. A biblical generation is 40 years long, as I've proven, previously proven from scripture, so I won't go into that here. So what that means is that whatever Jesus prophesied would happen to his generation needed to happen within 40 years of his own death and resurrection, or possibly within 40 years of the beginning of his ministry of him being revealed to Israel as their Messiah. His ministry apparently began around AD 30, which means that his prophecies of the destruction of Jerusalem and the judgment of his own generation would be need to be fulfilled by AD 70, which is exactly what happened. Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, and most of the population were killed or imprisoned. That destruction fulfilled of all that Jesus prophesied would happen within his own generation. All these things that he warned would happen to them, happen to them, happen within a few short years after his death and resurrection. Okay. Now in Matthew 24. 33 we read, so likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors, where really I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So again, he is telling them about some things, but let's see if these were the same things what he was talking about in Matthew 23. In contrast to Matthew 23 and other passages, such as in Luke 23, all these things that Jesus prophesied about his own generation concerning their coming judgment were limited to mostly the people of Jerusalem and the surrounding areas, not to the whole world. They were not the ones that were going to see the mega earthquakes, world wars, the coming of the man of sin, the sun and the moon and the stars and the heavens going completely dark. They were not the ones that would be gathered together by the angels to be forever with the Lord Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus said to his own generation, it was very harsh in Matthew 23, 33, ye serpents, you generation of wipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? He did not tell them that they would be caught up to him. He warned them that they were to go downwards. He also did not give them the incredible sign of the Son of Man that would be seen in the heavens before his second coming. All these things that Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24 and parallel passages were first of all prophesied privately to less than a handful of his disciples, not to the multitude. And secondly, all these things are little, if anything in common with that which Jesus prophesied for his own generation. So it stands to reason that since the prophecies are not the same, since they were not prophesied the same group of people, then this generation in Matthew 24, 23, 36 is not the same as this generation in Matthew 24, 34. The only possible way that this generation of Matthew 23, 36 and Matthew 24, 34 could be the same generation is if all these things prophesied in Matthew 24 had transpired by AD 70, including the second coming of Christ. However, as proven from scriptures spoken by Jesus himself, and also taught by these apostles, the second coming of Jesus was, they were teaching that it was going to be a long time in the future from the generation of Jesus and of the apostles. Neither Jesus nor the apostles thought that his second coming would take place before that generation passed away. The apostle Paul also confirmed that Jesus's generation was going to be subjected to God's judgment and wrath in his first epistle to the Thessalonians. We can read in one the Thessalonians, Chapter 2, verse 14, beginning in verse 14. For ye, brethren, 
became followers of the churches of God, which are in Judea, okay, which are in Christ Jesus, for ye also suffer like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. So this is what Paul is saying about that generation, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins all way for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. The apostle Paul wrote specifically in regards to the Jews in Judea that the wrath of God would be coming upon them to the uttermost just as Jesus prophesied. And again, those prophecies were fulfilled by around AD 70. Jesus himself said that his second coming would not be immediate, but that it would be long. So patience was required of his disciples. We can read in Matthew 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. Then they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oils, oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Okay. The word tarry in Matthew 25 Verse 5 is the Greek word chronizo, and it means to take time, that is to linger, to delay. Jesus thought that his second coming was going to take a long time, at least in the way man calculates times, time, which is what the apostle Peter taught as well. So long, in fact, that most people will stop believing that he is ever coming because it was seen that he would be lingering or delaying his coming for a very long time. Jesus would not have been teaching his disciples that he was coming back in their generation while teaching them at the same time that his second coming was a very long time away. And what did the apostle Paul teach about the second coming? Let's look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not sh soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that as God he sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Apostle Paul addressed the timing of Jesus' is coming in this passage. Okay. He tells us it's about the coming of, the, of our Lord Jesus, his second coming, our gathering together unto him at the time of his second coming, the day of Christ, his second coming. So this passage is about the second coming, okay? So there can be no doubt that the apostle subject in this passage is the timing of the second coming of Jesus Christ. In verse 2, Paul makes it quite clear that the second coming was not imminent in this time. They were not expecting Jesus to return right then. That you be not shaken soon, soon shaken in mind, nor be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us that the day of Christ is at, hand, is, is at hand. Meaning his day of Christ was not at hand means that Paul did not believe that it was imminent in his time as many people falsely teach. Yeah, people teach that, you know, that the apostle was saying, oh, Jesus is going to come back in their own time. No, as a matter of fact, they were teaching the opposite. They said his coming was not at hand, that it would be taking place in the future. As a matter of fact, even towards the end of his life, Paul wrote nothing about being alive to see Jesus' second coming. He made it quite, quite clear that he had finished his course and would now depart and go on to be with Jesus, not wait on the earth for Jesus' second coming. You can read that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For now I'm ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me on only, but also all that love his appearing. It is very plain that Paul understood the timing of Jesus' second coming that day to be in the future, not within his own lifetime. The term that day and his appearing both refer to the second coming, which certainly did not take place in Paul's lifetime. And I love that little, little expression that he used here, the time of my departure is at hand. You know, isn't that wonderful that... Uh, God can give us that understanding that, you know, yeah, you've been booked on a flight out of here. Wow, it's wonderful. I pray that will all happen to all of us, you know, sooner rather than later as this world really starts to fall apart. There are many, many things that are going on right now that are totally beyond our, you know, anything that we would have believed. We, we kind of knew some of these things were coming, but now they're starting to take shape. 
you know, it's it's uh, very, very, uh, the, what the world that is shaping up is re- truly a demonic and a satanic world in which we really have, want to have no part, okay? So we pray that God, like, you know, like he, he told Paul that his time of departure was at hand, like, you know, he will also book a departure for us out of here. The apostle Peter was even more direct in teaching that Christ's second coming could well be a thousand or more years in the future. Like the apostle Paul, Peter wrote of the time of his own departure, his own decease in 2 Peter 1.14. And this is what we read in, in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus has showed me. Moreover, moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Again, Peter did not write that he was waited, waiting for Jesus' second coming. He wrote that he was going to depart well before that time. And to his disciples, he wrote that they would still need his writings to be a guide. Not that Jesus was, he did not tell them Jesus was coming back in your own generation. So don't worry about it, boys. No, he said, you know, keep these writings, keep them in mind, because you're going to need this, this direction that I'm leaving for you. Okay. So he didn't need to leave them. If, if you know, if Jesus was going to be coming back and Peter was writing this towards the end of his life, which was somewhere around, you know, 65 AD or thereabout. So, I mean, the time for that generation was fast coming to an end. So Jesus would uh, need to return within the next few years. So, you know, if Peter expected that, he would have told his disciples, yeah, okay, I'm going to go. But, you know, don't worry, Jesus is going to be back in a couple of years. No, he didn't say anything like that. He said, no, keep these instructions I'm giving you in mind, because you're going to have some trials and, and that are going to come your way. You're going to have tests, and I want you to be ready for them. He said nothing that Jesus' second coming was at hand. As far as the timing of the second coming is concerned, he wrote that it would be so long that in the last days, which are obviously not his days, scoffers would come and mock the second coming that it will never happen. People that teach that Jesus' second coming has already taken place are scoffers because subtly they're teaching that it could never take this long, so he must already have come. See, the subtlety comes in many forms. Some people deny that it's ever going to happen. Some people will deny it by saying that it has already happened, but they're both scoffing. Okay, that's what it is. It's both deceptions. Others simply deny that there ever will be a second coming. They're busy trying to set up Christ's kingdom here, even though the king is not himself here yet. Let's look at 2 Peter verse, chapter 3, verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. So the so second coming was going to be after the last days, right? So obviously Peter didn't say that this is my time. He's placing this time somewhere in the future. Let's see how long in the future he said it would be. The last day scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Peter did not place the last days in the lifespan of his own generation, but at some time in the future, but how far in the future? Okay. And we read again in continuing in 2 Peter chapter 3. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. The one day is with the Lord is a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Peter taught that God does not calculate time as man calculates it. In comparison to his own minuscule lifestyle, you know, man, man has a very minuscule, a vapor of a lifetime, as, as God tells us, you know. He says, behold, my days are as in hand breath, so it's nothing. My age is as nothing before thee. So Peter taught us that, you know, God does not calculate time as man calculates time in comparison to his own ministry of lifetime. God is from everlasting to everlasting. A thousand years of man, thousand of man's years are but as yesterday for God. So Peter did place the last days in which Jesus would return at some time in the future, and I believe by giving us this uh, analogy of a of thousand years being as one day, he was writing that Jesus' second coming could be a thousand or more years in the future, okay? Which, seems, which would seem very long to man. And he also explained that, yeah, it'll seem very long to you, but for God, it is only a day or two. So we see that neither Jesus nor the apostle thought that his second coming would be within their own, within the lifetime of their own generation. Since the second coming is included in all these things that Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24. And we know that it is clearly taught that it would not happen in the life of the generation of Jesus and of the apostles. Then none of the other prophecies, none of the other prophesied events of Matthew 24 
and parallel passages could possibly have happened in the lifetime of that generation that lived in the first century. So the prophecies of Matthew 23 pertain to one generation, the prophecies of Jesus, the generation of Jesus, I mean, but the prophecies of Matthew 24 pertain to another generation, which will be the last generation living before the second coming, which is yet in the future. Now, lastly, I would like to touch briefly on the time frame in which the book of Revelation was written. The apostle John wrote the book of Revelation around AD 95, okay? But according to the 40 year time span of one generation, Jesus' generation would have passed away by AD 73 at the very latest. See, one generation is not meaning that, you know, all the people that are living at this point right now, you know, the, on the earth right now, we have babies that are born and then there are people that are 100 years old. That does not mean in the Bible, it is just a specific period of time from like one date to 40 years after that date. So the date would be like either, like I said, the beginning of Jesus' ministry or the time of his resurrection. And from that time, you add 40 years, that's the end of the generation. So although the Apostle John outlived that time, but quite a long time, okay, okay, it does not, he is not included within that generation. He outlived that generation because he lived beyond that period of 40 years. That was the lifespan of that one generation that was alive in Jesus' time. Therefore, the judgments that Jesus, you know, pronounced upon them needed to have to come to pass within that 40-year time frame, which it did, okay? But John outlived that generation. So he outlived it and he wrote the book of Revelation quite a long time after that generation had already passed away, after Jerusalem and Judea had already been destroyed, and everything that Jesus had pronounced in judgment upon them in Matthew 24, 23, I mean, had already been fulfilled, okay? So the book of Revelation, which not only parallels Matthew 24, but fills in a great deal more detail to these prophecies, was not even written until almost a quarter century after Jesus' own generation has suffered the wrath, destruction, and desolation prophesied to come upon them for the blood of the righteous, all the righteous on the earth and of Jesus. This is the reason why the book of Revelation was, not, was addressed to the seven churches in Asia, not to the churches in Judea and in Jerusalem, because there was no church in Jerusalem at that time. Jerusalem had been destroyed and Jerusalem would not be rebuilt till like, you know, many, many decades after that time. Jesus himself said to John that those things in Revelation, he said to John that those things he would see and hear in his vision had not yet been fulfilled, but would be fulfilled at some time in the future, right? Isn't that what Jesus said, write these things, which must come to pass, okay? So they weren't done yet. And since these events of, since the writings of Revelation and Matthew 24 and other passages, they are the same. Revelation is just a great deal more detail. That means nothing about Matthew 24 had happened and nothing certainly about Revelation had happened because, you know, John is writing this in 1895 or thereabouts. And he's saying all these things are yet in the future. So, okay. So again, like I said, that's the reason why the letters were not addressed to any church in Judea and Jerusalem because it didn't exist then. Jesus himself said to John that those things he would see and hear in a vision had not yet been fulfilled, but would be fulfilled in the future. So these prophecies, which are a detailed version of the Matthew 24 prophecies, would be fulfilled in the future. Jesus clearly taught us in Matthew 24 that one generation will see all these things fulfilled, not multiple generations and certainly not his own generation. Therefore, it is plain to see that the only generation that can see all these th things fulfilled has to be the last generation which will see the beginning of the end of the world, the beginning of sorrows, and will also see the end of the tribulation with the appearing of the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens over a period of time of just under 40 years, which again, I have you know spoken in detail about the length of the tribulation, et cetera. So I'm not gonna go into there. Those videos are on the channel. You know, Anybody wants to do some detailed study as to how long the tribulation is going to last. It's not going to be seven years. It's going to be just under 40 years. And we are now calculating. Anyway, let's continue. So let us not be scoffers and start questioning where is the promise of his coming, which Peter said people will. And, you know, deep down inside, people don't believe that, you know, Jesus is coming. No, 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 no. Or they, anyways, let's, let's continue. So let us not be scoffers and start questioning where is the promise of his coming. But we should be like the wise virgins and understand that it could take a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand years for all we know. But it is going to happen one day. What we understand now in this present time for all these signs that are coming into view is that the events prophesied to occur in the last generation, 
that will see the final sign of the Son of Man in the heavens, that will herald the second coming of Christ, have almost certainly begun. They have almost certainly begun, begun already in 2020. Okay. So as more of these signs come to pass, because we know what the signs are, it will become certain that we are indeed that last generation and the only generation that will see all these things prophesied in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and the book of Revelation come to pass within the next 40 years or less. That doesn't mean, you know, we'll all be around for the next 40 years. No, we you know, like I said, people have different ages the living right now have different age. Somebody could be, you know, somebody that's 20 could be around. Somebody that's uh, 60 like me would probably be gone, you know. So it doesn't matter. A lot of people are going to be gone. But it, that is not, the question is not, you know, who was born at what time. It is when did these events begin? And from that, we mark a period of 40 years. And then that's the time frame within which all these things have to be fulfilled. So I believe, you know, that it has been adequately, this uh, we have gone into some great deal of depth here of study to prove that uh, the generation of Jesus and the generation that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, 34, they are not the same generation. The things that Jesus talked about is what happened to his own generation all throughout the Gospels and in Matthew 23 in particular. They are not the same thing that Jesus thought us would happen in Matthew 24. That would concern not just the, 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 the small region of the world in Israel in Judea and thereabouts. No, it would concern the whole world. In, in Luke, you know, Jesus made it quite clear that as a snare shall those things come upon the whole earth, okay? And furthermore, because he placed the fulfillment of all these things, not some of them, like in everything in that chapter from the beginning of Matthew 24 to the time that to verse 34, Jesus said all these things. He said, you mark these things, what I'm telling you, as they begin to happen, until you see my sign, all those things, they must happen within the lifespan of one generation and one generation only. And it's not going to be spread out over like numerous generations. And it was certainly not the generation that was alive in Jesus' time. Therefore, these are future events. And I do believe that we are beginning to see the fulfillment of them. And it'll certainly be, uh, it, it, it will be, you know, like uh, the proof, uh, the evidence will become even more clear that it has indeed begun. And if it has, then, you know, you can mark in your chart 2020 and look ahead 40 years. And that's how long it's going to be. So don't be deceived by people that are going to tell you, you know, no, it'll be over in seven years or that, you know, the, the, the rapture is going to come or something like that. No, we won't be deceived for that. It's going to be a long time. And we are all most likely going to depart already from here long before that time. All right, my friends, so I'm just going to stop sharing the screen here. Wonderful. So let's, if anybody has something to add to it or to have, have a question, uh, please unmute and speak. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Please go right ahead. This is Terry. Um, I watched, we watched your video about the millennial kingdom. And I know this is off topic from today, but are you going to by any chance when you do the next part, talk about whether or not the Gog and Magog people will have a second chance at salvation or a chance at all? It doesn't seem to be. That's how I feel, but I didn't know if you were going to teach on it or not, because there's so many people that we know that debunk all that with their right, prophecy I mean, on sacrifices and the second or, you know, the third temple stuff. Yeah, sorry, Gog ahead. and Magog, as far as I can see from what in the book of Revelation in particular, it does not concern any any nation at this time. Okay. Okay. Right. So it, it's only going to be after the millennial millennium that uh, we will have. God, yeah, I am going to teach on that. It's actually interesting, you know, what the, what the Bible says about that and what we can understand from it. But as far as salvation is concerned, if those people that come against uh, against uh, Jesus uh, and, uh, you know, the saints at that time, the Bible, you know, is quite clear that fire came out of uh, from God from heaven and devoured them, okay? So I don't think that's salvation. You know? No, of course not. <laughs> right. So, so yes, so the people at least, now I'm not saying that, you know, in those times that everybody that is going to be living is going to come against God. There's going to be, you know, a vast multitude, as you said, you know, as the number is at the sand of the sea. But uh, I'm sure there are also people that will already be in the camp of the saints. So I don't know. I mean, that's a little bit of speculation. But as far as the people that are going to be deceived by Satan, for them, I don't see that, you know, there's any salvation. Okay, thank you. Looking forward to the teaching. 
Yeah, you're welcome. Actually, that was, uh, it, it is something, you know, I had not really studied in any manner of detail before, but uh, now that I have, it's just kind of interesting because how much information the Bible can give us within a very, you know, few verses of scripture. So I'm glad that, you know, that question came up and uh, it'll give us all a better understanding so that when these teachings come our way, which they do, it's not the purpose is not to go and try and, uh, you know, change everybody's mind or whatever, but at least in our own mind, we get settled that we know what the truth is and whatever these people or anybody else out there is teaching, very few people actually are going to be swayed by truth, you know, and they are so, so I don't, I don't even attempt to, but the purpose of doing these videos is not to try and correct those people that are offering those teachings, but, you know, for us to gain a better understanding of what the Bible is actually teaching. Yes. Thank you again. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. All right, my dear friends, uh, you know, as we approach the end of this year here, times are getting interesting, I would say. I don't know if interesting is right, but perilous is probably the more, more, uh, more accurate word to use. Uh, so I just wanted to, you know, also make you aware this is as, to, you know, like these things that are going on in our world. One of the things that is being pushed very heavily right now is home testing for COVID, okay? And uh, there is, a, of course, an agenda as there is in all these things. And the agenda, of course, is to lead us into the next stage of this operation, which is going to be that, you know, everybody is going to be, there's going to be an app that will be introduced, uh, which will be like your, like it is already in China, et cetera, uh, that uh, you're going to have to test yourself daily before it is already happening on a smaller level here. I know something's being done here in Canada already that, you know, it will be the, the control, the control that is going to be exercised is going to be tightened even more. Okay. The noose is going to be tightened in that sense that, you know, people will be required to take a daily test before they can go out for work, before they can go to the grocery shop, whatever, you know, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's happening. It's happening. So I'm in a way I'm glad because, you know, when we were in 2020, when all this started going, like my and my brother Femi, et cetera, when we were discussing, we were not hundred percent sure whether the tribulation is, is begun. And one of the, one of the, you know, uh, what science we have said that what we, well, we can see that if this thing kind of pans out, and like in the back in the old, you know, when they had SARS and swine flu, et cetera, those things came and went and life returned to what people thought of as normal. So I said, and if this thing comes to an end within a year or two, and then we go back to the days of 2019, then this is not the tribulation, but it doesn't seem it's ending. I think it's, it is intensifying. I think 2022 is going to be an even more uh, challenging year, but at the same time, when we keep in mind that that's what God has told us, that we keep our mind stayed on Jesus, then, you know, whatever is going to happen is going to happen. We are not going to be concerned with that. We are only going to be concerned with our redemption because we know with each day that passes, that redemption draws nearer and nearer. Okay, friends? Okay, so if anybody has, has something to say, please say. Otherwise, I'm going to close this meeting now. Thank you for joining me. God bless you all. And uh, I will again, uh, yeah, later in the week, uh, of course, there'll be another couple of meetings. Okay. Thank you. God bless you.
Oh